Hopefully everyone's having a nice day so far. Um, I'm delighted to present our speaker this year for the Iris Fisher Lectureship that was endowed by Dr. David Fisher. Um, and I'm just gonna spend a minute here first to tell you a little bit about this lectureship and the history of it before we get into introducing our, our speaker. So um, Dr. Fisher, as many of you may know, has been involved with the Yale School of Medicine for more than 55 years. He was the first medical oncologist in the New Haven community and remained in private practice for 30 years before joining the Yale Cancer Center in 1993 as a volunteer and then full-time in 1995. He's chaired or co-chaired the uh, Cancer Committee for the Yale Cancer Center and the Yale New Haven Hospital since 1997. And quality of life issues hold more than a professional interest for Dr. Fisher. These issues were of personal concern to him and his wife, Iris, who was diagnosed with sarco, sar, I'm not a clinician, sarcoidosis, <laughs> an incurable disease of the heart and lungs. And the couple's treatment decisions were weighed and balanced against the impact the therapies would have on Iris Fisher's personal well-being. So as Dr. Fisher has said, it is his hope that this lectureship will serve as a lasting memorial to his wife, Iris, while providing an educational opportunity for our physicians and staff for the benefit of patients at the Cancer Center. And he also has said that our current generation of physicians emphasizes laboratory medicine, which is extremely important, but that we also need to shift the balance away from treating only the disease and back to the total care of the patient. So thank you for those words, Dr. Fisher. I couldn't agree more with that. So I'm honored and delighted to introduce our speaker this year, uh, Dr. Lynn Henry. She's a medical oncologist at the University of Utah uh, School of Medicine and the leader of the Women's Cancer Center at the Huntsman Cancer Institute. Prior to her being at the University of Utah, she was on the faculty at University of Michigan for nine years after completing her hematology oncology fellowship there. And she has served as, currently serves, as the co-chair of the SWOG Symptom Management and Quality of Life Committee, and as a member of the NIH Symptom Management and Quality of Life Steering Committee. Her academic research career is focused on translational research in breast oncology, and her primary interest is in the predictors of response to and toxicity of endocrine therapy, and how toxicity relates to adherence and persistence with therapy and the quality of life of breast cancer survivors. She's conducted multiple translational studies involving analyses of clinical, biochemical, and genetic predictors of toxicity of adju adjuvant endocrine therapy for breast cancer, as well as clinical trials of interventions to improve symptoms due to treatment. So I think this is especially uh, a very relevant topic, not only for the Iris Fisher Memorial Lecture, but in general in, in regards to the way cancer care is moving forward. So thank you. I'd like to present you with the um, Iris Fisher Memorial Lecture plaque. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. So I wanna say how much of an honor it is uh, to be here talking with you today. And thank you very much to Dr. Fuchs, Dr. Irwin, Dr. Fisher for the invitation. So as she mentioned, I'm a breast medical oncologist and I really have focused primarily on toxicity associated with aromatase inhibitors uh, since my fellowship. So I wanted to give a little bit of that story and how that fits into the care of breast cancer survivors. I do have disclosures. Um, they're not relevant at all for this lecture. So just always like to start with a case, put everything in perspective. So Mrs. A was a 67-year-old female diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. It's ER positive, HER2 negative, and she was treated with typical standard of care therapy, mastectomy, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and then she started on an astrazole, one milligram daily. You know, she started developing aches and pains within a few months, came into clinic for her three-month visit, exam was totally unremarkable, uh, but she was definitely, these were starting to limit her, um, her ability to do her usual activities. They kept worsening, she stayed on the medicine, and so eventually discontinued the, the aromatase inhibitor medicine. Her symptoms completely resolved within about three weeks of discontinuing the anastrozole. So this may seem very straightforward and usual at this point, uh, but this was actually back, this was a patient who was on a clinical trial around 2006, 2007, and it wasn't that commonly recognized at that point that aromatase inhibitors cause these side effects. 
And so she was on a clinical trial I'll talk about a little bit later. And this actually led to the research that I've done, um, both starting during fellowship and really since that time. Unfortunately, still haven't quite figured out how all of these, uh, why these symptoms work and how to fix them. So it's been a, a good research career so far. So it led to a number of questions. You know, what are these aromatase inhibitor associated musculoskeletal symptoms? And I'll recap that briefly for those of you who don't think about breast cancer all the time. You know, can we predict who is going to develop the symptoms? Why do they happen in the first place? And most importantly, what can we do about them? So just to step back for a second, talk about breast cancer treatment. So if you have a patient in front of you diagnosed with hormone receptor positive breast cancer, you give local therapy, surgery, and or radiation. You may give chemotherapy, depending on the situation. And then you come to the decision about endocrine therapy. There are two different options. There's tamoxifen, which has been around since the 70s. And then there are the aromatase inhibitors. And they act very differently, but with the same goal of decreasing the risk of breast cancer recurrence. Of the aromatase inhibitors, there's two different classes. There's the azoles, that's anastrozole and letrozole. And then there's the steroidal, uh, which is exemestane. So when you have your patient sitting in front of you, you know, how do you decide what to give her? How do you decide whether to give tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitor? Is there a reason to choose one aromatase inhibitor over another? So we always think about precision medicine and we usually think about it in terms of chemotherapy, um, but it's true for endocrine therapy as well. We wanna get the right drug to the right person at the right time at the right dose. So we have these different options. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to focus specifically on aromatase inhibitors today because that's the focus of the specific toxicity. They're used regularly for chemo prevention, for treatment of adjuvant therapy, so curative breast cancer, and also in the metastatic setting. They can only be used if a woman is postmenopausal. They act by blocking the enzyme aromatase, which converts androgens to estrogens, and they can't overcome what the ovaries can do. And so really what you have to do is uh, render a premenopausal woman postmenopausal, either surgically or with, um, or chemically, um, or if a woman is postmenopausal already, she's a good candidate. And then you can use these drugs and they make women sort of super postmenopausal. There are three third generation aromatase inhibitors in routine use. Um, they all have similar benefits, similar toxicity profiles. Um, they decrease the risk of disease recurrence and in a subset have been shown to improve overall survival. Now compared to tamoxifen, they actually have quite different side effect profile because they work differently. Um, but they are associated overall with fewer adverse events, but they do have some very key adverse events that are important. Musculoskeletal symptoms is what we're really going to focus on today, um, and I'll describe those in a minute also can cause vasomotor symptoms, um, hot flashes, can cause bone loss because it's a pure anti-estrogen, and also can cause vaginal dryness, which is something else that's very difficult to treat because we don't want to use estrogen. But focusing specifically on the musculoskeletal symptoms, there's no specific um, definition. There's no specific pathognomonic finding. You know, when you examine somebody, um, their joints look normal. We don't see evidence of inflammation. You don't see swelling. You don't see erythema. You don't see, um, you know, it, it doesn't look warm, hot, like, a, like an infected joint. If you talk to the patient, there's a very wide description of what they'll tell you. There can be joint pain. There can be joint stiffness. There can be muscle stiffness, myalgias. Um, you will see an increased risk of carpal tunnel syndrome, increased risk of trigger finger. So it really is all over the place. And this makes it very difficult to do research because not everyone uses the same definition of what a AI arthralgias are. There was a study in Cl at Columbia University um, that was published about a decade ago now that really tried to characterize patients in a cross-sectional study. And as you can see, about anywhere from, uh, let's say, 48% of patients reported pain. These were AI-treated patients. 44% um, reported stiffness, and quite a high proportion were moderate or severe. So these are not just sort of some aches and pains that are typical um, in the postmenopausal woman and that they can just live with. They actually can be quite bothersome. So why do we actually care about AI arthralgias? So side effects are one of the main reasons why people stop taking their aromatase inhibitor. Either stop taking it every day or they start taking you know, half a pill or they might stop altogether. 
and poor adherence and persistence, so not taking it as, as prescribed or stopping early, um, has been associated with increased risk of breast cancer recurrence and also increased breast cancer mortality um, in multiple clinical trials. So these, these are a real, um, they have very negative implications, not just on quality of life, but on breast cancer survival. So can we figure out who's going to get these symptoms? So here again, turn to personalized medicine. Usually you think of doing molecular profiling of a tumor, try to figure out which drug might work the best for a specific tumor. You then might think of uh, looking at prognostic markers, try to split people into different groups depending on their breast cancer prognosis, Dep markers uh, predictive of drug sensitivity or resistance, you know, who's most likely to get the benefit. But really what we're focused on here are markers predictive of adverse events. Because here, you know, the question is, are there any germline markers we can look at, any biochemical markers, anything we can use to try to divide people into these different groups so we can figure out, okay, tamoxifen might be best for her, and astrazole for her, and letrozole for her. If we can predict who will develop symptoms, we can tailor treatment accordingly. So you might choose the right one the first time. Um, and physicians can be more proactive about interventions with the thought that if you know someone's likely to develop some sort of toxicity, is there something you can do up front so she doesn't develop the toxicity in the first place and doesn't come to you wanting to stop the medicine? Instead, you can, right now, we just wait for the side effects to happen and then we try to treat them. And it's always uh, more problematic when you're trying to do that. So we ran a large clinical trial um, at three different institutions. It was at University of Michigan, Johns Hopkins, and Indiana University. And if you remember the story about tamoxifen and CYP2D6, there was this group um, of pharmacogeneticists and oncologists who were evaluating tamoxifen and CYP2D6 and found that CYP2D6 may have an influence on how well the body metabolizes tamoxifen. So it was the same group of investigators um, who then got together to do this trial. It was uh, funded by the NIH. And they hypothesized that inherited gene variations in candidate genes will predispose women to different effects of AI therapy. And in particular, they were looking at breast density. So the primary endpoint for this trial was breast density. And what they wanted to do was compare two different aromatase inhibitors. So they picked letrozole, which was a non-steroidal aromatase inhibitor, and exemesane, which was a steroidal. There were 500 patients enrolled, all postmenopausal, early stage breast cancer. The vast majority were stage one through three. And they could either be first line aromatase inhibitor or be switching from tamoxifen to an aromatase inhibitor. Got randomized uh, to one of the two drugs and followed for a total of two years. And patients were fairly closely monitored. So they got monitored at baseline and then at one, three, six, 12, and 24 months. I think at baseline, they had something like 17 tubes of blood drawn for this study. It was, uh, it was approved by the IRB. Um, and, uh, but they were very heavily um, evaluated. We were not looking at all at breast cancer outcomes. We were only looking at secondary outcomes. So we were looking at breast density, bone density, a lot of different um, hormone levels, things like that. And then this was around the same time um, that I was in fellowship and we were starting to notice all these aromatase inhibitor associated arthralgia. So they added in a subset of a sub project um, specifically looking at that. So that was my part of this trial. And so what we did was we evaluated patients using two different questionnaires. We had just a simple visual analog scale looking at pain, zero to 10. And then we also used the health assessment questionnaire because we really didn't know what this was. And this was a uh, questionnaire that was routinely used in rheumatoid arthritis looking at functional status. So we used those two questionnaires and then we predefined criteria that if their functional status worsened to a certain degree or their pain went up to a certain degree relative to baseline, they would be considered um, to have what we were calling AIMS, and they would be referred to rheumatology. And so our rheumatologists evaluated about 30 patients or so. They were convinced up front this was gonna look like fibromyalgia. Um, but we checked a few things and we did not find any evidence of fibromyalgia. We didn't find any evidence that this was autoimmune, um, but we, didn't, we still weren't really sure what this was, but this was all built into our protocol. And then the other thing that we built in was patients who were in the XMSDAIN group, if they had difficulty tolerating, they could switch over to the letrozole and vice versa. So we learned a lot about switching from one to the other as well. 
It was not mandated that they switch though. So we had 500 patients, about you know, evenly split. We had about 75, 74% uh, of patients on, in the letrozole group continued uh, for the full two years, only 63% in the exemestane group. We did have some discontinue for other reasons, such as becoming premenopausal during the trial um, or having disease recurrence. Um, but we ended up with a total of 31% of patients discontinued for toxicity. And about three quarters of that was related to musculoskeletal toxicity. So it was quite a substantial proportion. We also looked specifically at time to treatment discontinuation. This was for any symptom. You can see that the folks who were on exemestane did discontinue drug a little bit faster than those on letrozole. Although I will say that this has not been replicated in any other study. There aren't that many studies though, that have compared these two particular drugs head to head. So you know, we had all this, this wealth of information. And so we took both our study and tried to look for predictors. And we also looked in the literature to see what other groups had identified predictors. So in terms of clinical predictors of developing AIMS, those who had an increased risk of toxicity seemed to be those who had prior chemotherapy. And that was fairly universal. Every study that has looked at that pretty much has shown that prior hormone replacement therapy, um, those who were younger, so newly postmenopausal, um, so women in their 50s were more likely to develop symptoms than women who were in their 80s, for example. It's been a little bit conflicting about BMI. One study showed that if you were overweight or obese, you were more likely to develop symptoms. Another study showed that if you were um, overweight, you actually were less likely to develop symptoms, but if you were obese, you were more likely. Our study didn't show a BMI effect. And then also baseline pain seems to be predictive. So if women had pain to start with, they were more likely to get pain, which might be expected. Prior tamoxifen seemed to be associated with decreased risk of toxicity. And we don't know if there was something specific about tamoxifen that was making it less likely for people to develop pain, or if it was just simply time since diagnosis and time since chemotherapy that played a role. So there wasn't anything really clear cut that we could come up with a definition of you are at high risk. So then we looked at genetic predictors, we and others. Um, there was a big GWAS case control study from MA27 that identified um, an imputed SNP near TCL1A um, that was associated. It was the only one that was, that was borderline statistical significance. And it's possibly related to an inflammatory cytokine, um, IL-17 um, RA expression. Uh, there was a candidate gene approach was done by a group at Memorial Sloan Kettering. They, or sorry, it was the University of Pennsylvania at that point. Um, IL-6 uh, variants in the promoter region were associated with pain severity and pain interference. Also, um, the aromatase gene itself, there was a TTTA repeat. Um, the more repeats you had, the more likely you were to have arthralgias. And then in our trial, we found one specific variant in the estrogen receptor alpha gene that was associated with an increased risk of discontinuation, but only in patients taking XMSA, not in patients taking letrozole. So there's a number of different things out here. I will say that none of these have actually been validated in another trial, although it has been tried. Um, so we don't know, again, if any of these um, really are specifically related with risk of developing AIMS. And then we looked at whether or not it's simply symptom burden that's associated. So patients who reported more symptoms at the time they were starting aromatase inhibitors, and we focus specifically on the symptoms listed here, but if you had more symptoms before you started, you were more likely to have symptoms on the aromatase inhibitor. And actually a study um, from that MA27 trial again, which was a, a different trial that was looking at two different aromatase inhibitors, they found a very similar finding. So it does seem to be that, tr that just burden of symptoms plays a big role here, which isn't unexpected. So we know that non-persistence with AI therapy is associated with some demographic and clinical factors, possibly with some inherited genetic variants with symptom burden. And there's a big trial that recently finished accrual. It's called E1Z11. It's being done by ECOG Akron, has a thousand patients, and they're gonna be able to validate some of these. So I heard from Dr. Stearns, who's one of the PIs of that trial recently, and they have started to talk with their statisticians. So I'm hoping we get more information from that trial since it's um, a little bit more recent, and they prospectively followed people for a year specifically with the goal of trying to identify a definition of and predictors of developing AIMS. <clears throat>
But for right now, we're unable to determine the likelihood of toxicity for an individual patient, but we do know more than we did before. So, you know, this question of symptom burden, so part of it is if we treat the constellation of symptoms rather than focusing on each individual symptom, will that be more effective? So, for example, if you can use acupuncture and try to treat pain and try to treat um, fatigue at the same time, are you going to end up with a patient who's tolerating treatment better than if you use a specific drug for pain and then a specific drug for, or something else for fatigue? There's no good drug for fatigue. Um, so that was one thing. And then the other thing, which I mentioned earlier, is really upfront management of symptoms is probably a better approach than trying to treat everything out of after the fact. So, you know, we've learned a lot, uh, or some, about what predicts um, the likelihood of developing these symptoms. But, you know, do we really understand why they happen in the first place? So we don't know. Um, obviously, estrogen depletion is a likely candidate just because these drugs work by lowering your estrogen level. So that can be systemic or it could be localized. So we know about, um, we know that the drugs will lower estrogen all through the body. But in particular, um, there were some studies that came out looking specifically at bones, nerves, and tendons, because that seems to be where some of the symptoms are. We also looked at the central nervous system, so we'll talk about both of those in a minute. And then there were some alternate mechanisms proposed as well, one related to inflammatory process or autoimmune disease, um, which has not shown to be the case so far with what we know, and also vitamin D deficiency. So this is the result, um, these are the results from the, one of the many th trials called VITAL. Um, this was a relatively small trial, it was done at the University of Kansas. And in this, it was basically a prevention trial. So women starting in uh, letrozole had to have low-ish vitamin D levels to start with, so less than 40. And they were randomized either to a high dose of vitamin D, which is 30,000 international units a week, versus standard, which is, um, somewhere between six and 1200 a day and treated for six months. And they had a composite endpoint for musculoskeletal symptoms. So they combined the results from two different, um, two different questionnaires plus looking at discontinuation and found that at 24 weeks, if you took the high dose vitamin D, 37% of patients reported musculoskeletal symptoms as compared to 51% if you took the high dose, so, I mean the standard dose. So this was not statistically significant. We still have way too many people with symptoms. And so they, they did look specifically at vitamin D levels, how they changed over the time in the trial um, to see if contamination was an impact because anytime you're using a treatment that could people could get over the counter or could get prescribed from another physician, then you always have to be careful. Um, but it looked like it was really, there wasn't a lot of contamination going on in this patient population. So this did not seem to be the answer. Uh, there was another trial, it's called IBIS-2. It was a breast cancer prevention trial. So compared to nastrozole to placebo, 13% um, had adequate vitamin D levels at the start, which means 87% did not and baseline levels of vitamin D were not predictive. So this was a big hype for a while. We still obviously recommend adequate levels of vitamin D just because we know that this can impact bone density, um, but we don't specifically use vitamin D to try to help treat the arthralgias anymore. So there's this question of localized estrogen depletion. So we know that um, estrogen receptors are all over the place. And so um, there was a group in uh, Europe that noticed that there were a lot of women, they did MRIs actually of the wrist, and they noticed that there was tenosynovitis, so inflammation of the tendons, also some fluid around the tendons, and um, they found that these changes on MRI were, I, were associated with decreased grip strength, and we know that women who take aromatase inhibitors often like, have, report a harder time, like opening jars and things like that. And so everyone got very excited that maybe this was what was causing problem is it's actually a local issue going on, and that's why people have stiffness and things in their hands. Uh, but when they actually went back and looked at the data, it wasn't associated specifically with the musculoskeletal symptoms. So it doesn't seem like it's just a local problem going on, at least in the nerves and tendons. We then looked in the central nervous system. So there's a group at University of Michigan, which is where I was when I did all of this work, um, that uh, works on chronic pain. They were the group that thought all this was going to be fibromyalgia. Uh, 
And so they've developed a methodology to actually assess, or they and others, uh, worked on a methodology to assess pain threshold. So if you talk to different people, some people will say, oh, I have a really high pain tolerance, and other people will say, oh, you know, everything hurts. And so, you know, that's pretty much true. It is actually true. Some people can tolerate pain better than others. And we know that estrogen does modulate some of this. Um, part of that is because women are able to go through childbirth. And so we know that estrogen levels are really high. It makes their pain threshold very high. And that's how they're able to do it without epidurals if they choose to. Um, in premenopausal women, we also have some data. So women with chronic pain like TMJ, there does seem to be an association between when they have the most pain and the time in their menstrual cycle when their estrogen levels are the lowest. There aren't many data in postmenopausal women. There was only one study I could find out there that looked at women either on hormone replacement therapy or not, um, and it wasn't very conclusive. So there's, we don't know much about the postmenopausal situation, but surely in premenopausal, there seems to be an association. So we decided to look at this in our aromatase inhibitor associated in our aromatase inhibitor treated patients. So this is the older version of the system. It's now fancy and computerized. Um, but in the old days, they actually had these um, bottles full of buckshot that were certain weights. And what you would do is you would put your thumb in this little device that would put up like a little plunger that came down on your thumb. And it would, you'd put a little bit on and patients or the person being tested had to say whether it was no pain, mild pain, moderate pain, or severe pain. And when they got to where they said, don't do that anymore, that was where we, we didn't go higher or you went up to 10 kilos depending. Um, so this was how you measured it. Um, and then there's, there's another interesting phenomenon that happens uh, because if you if you have pain in one part of your body, then for most people, then if you hurt something else, that doesn't hurt as much. Like if you've already stubbed your toe and then you squish your finger, it doesn't hurt as much. But for some people it actually have the opposite, where if you, um, if, if something already hurts and then you have another insult, it actually hurts more. And that's often the case in fibromyalgia. And so um, there's a, a descending pain uh, pathways mechanism that modulates all of this. And so we didn't know if either the regular pain uh, tolerance or this other descending pain pathways could potentially be regulated by estrogen. So we tested it. And so our questions were, are women with increased pain sensitivity more likely to discontinue AI therapy? And the answer was no. So that was before we lowered their estrogen. And then at three months after they'd been on aromatase inhibitor for a while, um, did, did pain sensitivity seem to play a role? And we did actually find that those who subsequently discontinued because of toxicity were more likely to be more sensitive to pain, have a lower pain threshold. Um, but it was only a small amount. We didn't know if it was truly clinically significant. So we actually haven't pursued this anymore. But it's possible. And it'll get, when I talk about duloxetine in a minute, I'll circle back to that a little bit. So we also then tried total shotgun, you know, shot in the dark kind of thing, pilot study looking at metabolomics and lipidomics because everything with omics in the name is really interesting these days. And so what we did was we just took cases and we took controls and wanted to see, you know, what, what does estrogen depletion with aromatase inhibitor do um, to metabolomic and lipidomic profiles and do those explain why people get pain? Fortunately, the answer was no, not that we could find, um, at least not with metabolomics. With lipidomics, we found a little hint of something. So um, these, you can't possibly tell what all the little dots are. Um, they relate to different lipid classes. But as you can see down in the controls, um, after three months in aromatase inhibitor, there aren't as many spots down at the bottom compared to the other three groups. And they have less lipid species with long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. So these are PUFAs. And so we don't really know what to make of this, but I did recently get a grant to try to look more into this. So hopefully in a few years, I will actually be able to tell the rest of this story. Um, but for now, you know, we don't think it's likely that they changed their diet. Um, so specifically in the people who didn't you know, get any pain. So we're, we're trying to look more into this to try to understand it a little bit better. But there's a question there, and that all relates to inflammation and everything else. So it's possible. So we still don't understand the mechanism, but we do still need to manage our patients. So how can we best prevent or treat the symptoms?
So there's multiple different interventions that have been studied. Uh, they're switching from one another, uh, one aromatase inhibitor to another, which I mentioned earlier. That actually worked about 40% of the time. And you would think that, you know, we're switched from letrozole to exemestane or vice versa. They work the same way. They, um, they have the same side effect profile. Seems like it shouldn't work, but it does. And we don't understand, is it just people metabolizing the different drugs differently? We don't know if it's more of a psychological effect. We don't know if it's because you've had your estrogen reduced already, that maybe it's different the second time around. Um, but it does work for a number of people. Of course, some people end up just getting completely different side effects with the second one as well. Uh, there's a number of medications that have been studied, which I'll talk about in a minute, and then also some non-pharmacologic interventions. So uh, most of what I'm going to talk about are SWOG trials. So SWOG 0927, this was omega-3 fatty acids versus placebo for AI arthralgias. The reason why this was tested um, was because there was some data that said omega-3 fatty acids might work in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, we didn't actually have any preliminary data to say it should work in AI arthralgias, and it doesn't seem like they're the exact same um, underlying mechanism, but this was tested. And so they were randomized to either omega-3 fatty acids or a placebo. And in this case, the placebo needed to be oily in order to match. And so they used a soybean corn oil combination for the placebo, treated patients for 24 weeks. And as you can see here, the omega-3 fatty acids were in blue, placebo was in yellow, and their worst pain scores did go down over time, but in both groups. So about 60% of people in both groups had a benefit um, and didn't see a statistically significant or clinically meaningful benefit, uh, difference between the two groups at all. Now, they tried to go back and look at this in a little bit more detail. They looked at a number of different factors to see could they tease out anything about who might be getting the most benefit. And BMI, body mass index, was one thing that came up. So as you can see here, if you look in the worst pain group, this, this group here is um, the BMI less than 30, so um, not obese. And you can see that omega-3 fatty acid had a decrease of about 1. Point, my, about 1.8 whereas the folks treated with placebo actually had a decrease of just over two. And so numerically, there was more of a benefit in the placebo group compared to the treatment group, um, and, which was completely the opposite in the obese patients, uh, where you saw a fairly substantial improvement um, with omega-3 fatty acids and not much of an improvement at all um, with the placebo. And you know, so anytime you find something that is not completely expected, you have to try to explain it. And so in this case, the, we, we don't have a good explanation for why the placebo seemed to work better in the patients who weren't as um, overweight. Um, but for the patients who are obese, you know, omega-3 fatty acids do have a, an anti-inflammatory um, properties. And so maybe because women who are obese um, have more sort of, a, of an inflammatory milieu in their system, um, maybe this, that was part of why they were seeing more of a benefit. Really not sure. I know that Dr. Hirschman and her group um, were trying to look at some cytokines and things to try to understand this a little bit more, um, but we really don't have a good explanation yet. The next trial that we did was, or that I'm talking about is SWOG 1202. So this is actually a trial that I was the national PI for. Um, we had done a small pilot of duloxetine versus placebo at Michigan and found some promising results and so took it to SWOG and were able to uh, run this trial. The reason why we wanted to look at duloxetine in the first place, again, in part goes back to my group of chronic pain colleagues thinking that this was fibromyalgia and that duloxetine um, does work for fibromyalgia. It's FDA approved for that. Um, the other thing is going back to the pain issue again. So these descending um, pain pathways where some women or men um, will sort of be hypersensitive to pain if you already have an insult. Duloxetine is thought to make that pain processing more efficient and to make it so that they're not as hypersensitive to pain. That's been shown to be how it works for diabetic numbness and tingling. And we don't yet know if that also is how it works uh, when you're treating uh, patients with cancer that don't have diabetes. But that's how duloxetine is thought to work. So that's why we tried it. Looked promising, so then we ran this trial. So everybody got standard doses of duloxetine uh, for 12 weeks versus placebo. In this case, the placebo was a sugar pill. 
literally. And uh, we stratified patients by baseline pain and by prior taxane. And so we did see an improvement. Um, the blue line is duloxetine, the red line is placebo. And you can see that both groups actually decreased pretty quickly within the first two weeks, um, but with the duloxetine group improved more. Um, and then the lines were pretty horizontal, or uh, sorry, parallel after that. Um, but again, we had a huge placebo response. We had about 60% of people had an improvement in the placebo group, 70% had an improvement in the duloxetine group. So, I mean, we, we expect a placebo response. It does confound a lot of the studies that, we're to, that we design. We're trying to understand placebo response more. Um, the difference was 0.82 points, and technically, um, the minimal, minimally clinically important difference should be one. So although we were statistically significantly better, we were not um, clinically um, better. Because we had the result from 0927 showing there was a difference by BMI, we again looked in our trial for the same thing, and we found a very similar result. So you can see that at every time point, two weeks, six weeks, and 12 weeks, duloxetine was significantly better than placebo in terms of reduction in average pain um, in the obese group, but not in the non-obese group. There really was no difference between the two. And the thing I think is most fascinating is that if you look you know, and at every time point, if you are not obese, whether you took duloxetine or placebo didn't seem to matter. Um, but you got about the same benefit as you did if you took duloxetine if you're obese. It was actually that this group, the obese folks getting placebo, really didn't have a placebo effect for some reason. So we're looking at this trial more. We have um, samples that we're, we've run cytokines, and so those are going to be analyzed. And we're also looking at genetics. Uh, we're looking at both um, SNPs that are involved in duloxetine metabolism and estrogen uh, signaling and things like that. And we're also going to the literature about placebo response and trying to look specifically, can we identify patients who are more predisposed to placebo responses? Um, because that literature is actually out there to see if we can, what we find when we analyze our data that way. It's purely exploratory. We obviously are going to have to take it to a different group to validate. But you know, these, these two findings were very interesting. We don't quite understand why we're seeing these big differences between obese and non-obese patients in terms of response to treatment. You know, is, is it real? That's the first question. Um, if it is real, is it because of something about the placebo that was used? It was something about differences between the etiology of AI arthralgias and obese versus non-obese patients? You know, we really don't understand this yet, so it's still a work in progress. So switching to the non-pharmacologic um, approaches, SWOG S1200 was just published last year. This was looking at acupuncture. There had been a single site study that showed that acupuncture was beneficial. This was done in a multi-site um, trial through SWOG, which is very important because it, you don't want it all to be due to your acupuncturist. And so here, true acupuncture did result in a significantly greater improvement in pain. Um, compared to either sham acupuncture or weightless control. So this is something that I definitely offer to my patients. We do have acupuncture available at our cancer center and patients really don't like taking medicines if they can avoid it. And then we have Melinda's trial, um, the HOPE trial. So this was for patients AI treated who had at least three out of 10 worst pain, were very sedentary, randomized to exercise versus usual care. And again, showed that getting people to be more active, especially if they were not active to start with, uh, did seem to be beneficial in this patient population. So if I'm trying to think about how I approach patients, you know, if they're starting aromatase inhibitor therapy, I do always educate them about what symptoms to watch for. Sometimes I'm not sure that's always a good idea. You know, people who read the package inserts and then get every single symptom. Um, I do consider checking vitamin D, but more from a bone health perspective. And then if they develop symptoms, I mean, all of my patients, I encourage exercise and weight loss, but I especially do if they've developed the symptoms and they haven't been very active, especially if it's been winter. And then if they are developing moderate or severe symptoms, often I'll switch first uh, from one aromatase inhibitor to another. But if that's not effective, then I do think about adding in medication. I don't like treating side effects of a medicine with another medicine if I can avoid it. Um, but I think sometimes we really do want to do what we can to help our patients continue to take these medicines and not have it negatively um, impact their quality of life. So we want to treat people with a drug that's most likely to be effective. 
But we're also asking our patients to take a medicine for five to 10 years, and it can cause side effects. And so really, we always have to have a balance. And I know this came up in the paragraph that you read earlier, where we, we want as good outcomes as we can get with as little toxicity. But we know that what we do, um, you know, we, we always want to do what's best for our patients. And we really need to try to achieve that balance whenever we can. So I want to just acknowledge all of my collaborators that I've had through the years. Um, most of them have been either at Michigan or associated with the big um, ELF trial that we conducted. Uh, Dr. Zubieta at University of Utah is very big into placebo response. Um, great folks at SWOG um, that I've been working with, and then all of my funding support. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. So your last slide actually was quite intriguing because I think in the clinic, the most commonly used drugs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And it looks like there is no data that actually shows that this is better than placebo. I guess it's just grandfathered in because they are good drugs for pain in general. Oh, the non-steroidals? Yeah. Yeah, so most of the original trials or studies that came out, I would say, um, they just sort of assumed that people were taking them. And so they commented on whether or not um, they seem to work. And the general conclusions were yes for some people, but not for everyone. Um, but no one has gone back and done a an actual clinical trial that I've seen looking at non -steroidals. I did see one small study presented at a, as a poster, and I don't know that I ever saw it presented looking at glucosamine chondroitin. That's something else that patients will often say that they, they try taking. And um, that one did not show um, a significant improvement, either statistically or clinically. Um, I don't know if it was ever published, uh, but certainly patients will come in and say, hey, can I take this? And I say, yes, but don't waste your money if it doesn't work after a month or so. But yeah, no, I think they just have been grandfathered in. We, we sort of skipped right over that because that was the obvious thing for people to try initially. Steroids work really well too, but we obviously can't uh, use steroids. There, there is actually a paper about steroids. Um, but we can't use those long term, so not helpful. Could you comment on the measurement of arthralgia? Because you know, I know there's the Womac and the Quick Dash and the BPI, but sort of the validity of these questionnaires and any future research being done um, to improve the validity of those surveys. Yeah. So you know, assessment of pain is always challenging. Um, you know, I've. Through the years, I've learned a lot about assessing pain. So when we started out, we started out with the hack and the VAS, which were certainly not developed for this at all. Uh, but really what we were looking at there was we were looking at a pain scale, zero to 10, um, and we were looking at the impact of pain on someone's functional status. And so we made the, the mistake of not specifically saying joint pain. And so we have pain scores all over the place from our first study because people might have had a headache or they might have had breast pain from their surgery. You know, they have pain from all over the place. And so um, many of our patients, when you actually look longitudinally across the study, their pain got better because they were further out from surgery. And so I learned a lot from that experience. And so what we've been using in SWOG mostly is the brief pain inventory. It was developed by um, Dr. Cleland. Um, I think in the 80s, and but Don Hirschman was the first one to use it in SWOG, and she actually modified it. So instead of saying pain, they, she actually inserted the word joint. So it specifically says joint pain. I don't know that anyone went back and validated it, which technically you should have done, um, but we've now been using that consistently. The nice thing about the brief pain inventory is that it measures average pain, worst pain. You can calculate a pain severity, and then also it looks at pain interference. And from our studies, our first study where we were limited by the actual pain score, interpreting it, um, I found that the, the function, the interference, actually is probably one of the most important things that's helpful because, you know, it's, if you ask everyone in this room, um, I mean, there may be a lot of zeros, but there's probably a lot of people who would report pain, but you're going to have different numbers all over the place, and it's, it's all sort of anchored within your own personal self. You know, if my knee hurts, I might call it a two, but someone else might have that same experience and call it a seven. So trends over time are what's important. But I think when you actually are asking the questions about 
the interference, I think that's when you start to get some more reliable information. We then also have used those WOMAC is looking specifically at knees, um, knee arthritis. The M sacra was looking at hand symptoms. The DASH is looking at upper extremity. So depending on what you expect to see and what where you think the symptoms are going to be, you can specifically try to hone in on some of that. And we use it more for validation. If you're seeing similar trends, if you're using a general pain score versus one specifically for knees versus one specifically for hands, and you're getting the same patterns every time, it makes us feel a little bit more certain about our findings. Um, but the more we ask our patients to complete, the more burden there is, the more likely they are to just quickly go through all the questions and not really read them. And so we have to be you know, very judicious when we're choosing what questionnaires to use and how much burden to have. And then, oh yes, Andrea. Since there's recent data about using a lower dose of tamoxifen, patients often lower their own dose for their AIs. Any data on whether that is useful or certain people should lower them or not? I have not seen any data specifically looking at lowering aromatase inhibitor dose and the impact on symptoms. Um, anecdotally, I've certainly had some patients try doing it every other day instead of every day or trying to cut the pill in half. Um, and I have yet to have a patient where that actually works sufficiently that she stayed on the medicine. Um, but I haven't seen anyone looking at lower doses, specifically trying to improve tolerance. I mean, there were, there were studies in the metastatic setting trying to see if what the right dose is to use from an efficacy standpoint. Um, but I haven't actually um, seen anything about what you're asking about. So I want to do a little shout out to Sarah Mugallion because you are studying AI adherence. Mm -hmm. So not specifically looking at arthralgias, but that's one factor related to AI adherence. And mm -hmm. so you are starting recruitment and launching of a, 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 a um, what's the correct term for the, yeah, <laughs> but for the, but the, the, the back and forth of the tech bi-directional um, text messaging. And so you're going to be recruiting patients from uh, Smilo and the care centers. Kurt, you want to make any comments about your trial? Sure. Thank you. Um, <laughs> just a plug for this trial. So we call it beta text. It stands for breast cancer endocrine toxicity adherence trial, um, where we're going to be looking at text messaging on a daily weekly and monthly basis, um, sending patients text messages, asking whether or not they're taking their medication, asking about any side effects that they might be experiencing, and if they are experiencing side effects, uh, how severe those side effects are, and, and asking about any barriers to adherence that they might be experiencing. And the idea is that patients then respond back to, uh, to the text messages and then their responses can be dealt with in real time. So the, the underlying premise is that by enhancing bidirectional communication between patients and their providers, that we're going to be able to address side effects with a lot of the things that Lynn has, has talked about um, this afternoon in real time. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Lynn. Thank you so much. Um, oh, one more question in the back. Yes, uh, thanks so much. Um, have you looked for um, um, other improvements uh, other than pain uh, for uh, high BMI patients who continue the, uh, the treatment? Uh, was there any improvement in their mental or um, physiological uh, or their well-being? Yeah, so this gets at one limitation of doing trials through SWOG. Um, whenever we're using the cooperative group mechanism, unless we have specific funding to incorporate a lot of um, a lot of patient reported outcomes, uh, we are very limited in what we can include. And so we did actually have a measure in the duloxetine trial looking at depression. We had the PHQ-9. 
uh, because we needed to be able to assess that. Um, but we also had the limitation in the duloxetine trial that if you actually needed to be on an antidepressant, uh, because it was a placebo controlled trial and because antidepressant, you can't be on another antidepressant and be on duloxetine because of the risk for serotonin syndrome, we really had very few people on that trial who had any sort of level of depression um, just because of the patient population we had to include. And so we didn't, it was a very low level, so we didn't see any change. Um, and then we also didn't have that many other things that were collected. So we did, however, include the FACT ES, um, at least the, enough to be able to calculate the trial outcome index. So that included physical function and it included the endocrine symptom checklist. And one of the things that we have not yet looked at is the see if any other things changed on that symptom checklist. I have a whole list of things that I would like our statistician to look at, and that's one of them. And so um, we, it's, the problem is, is it's, it's single questions about hot flashes, single questions about various things. So it's, it's not as robust, but we could at least try to get some clues that could then be looked at later. Um, for example, I don't know how well duloxetine works for hot flashes. Um, there was one small study that suggested it might help, but um, I think there's other antidepressants out there that work a lot better, um, just based on my own patient's experience. Um, but there are a few things we can look at, but we were really limited in what we could include in 1202 and um, what could be included in 0927 just from a purely logistical and financial standpoint. So, Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you very you. much. Appreciate it.